What's going on, everybody? Guys, he's pumped. I'm pumped. So Welcome pumped. to the Millionaire University Business Training. Today, we're going to talk about the seven phases of your business. These are the phases that we have used to build seven-figure companies, and many of our clients have used to go from zero to six, seven, eight figures and beyond. Okay, maybe not beyond. I don't think we've had any nine, but, <laughs> but we're going to get there. One of you is going to get there. Apply the things that we will teach you today and guaranteed that you will grow a successful business. It's not easy, but it's very possible, and it'll change your life forever. Should we get going? Let's do it. Let's get to it. Let's go. Now, before we dive in, I've got a secret to tell you. You want to hear the secret, Tara? Yeah, tell me. And everybody else, all a business really is, is a list of to-dos. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> profound. That's the whole point. It's so not profound and so basic and so simple that someone might miss it. That's all a business is. It's a list of to-dos. And once you execute on this list of to-dos, you have... Money, 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 money. <laughs> now, once again, just to reiterate, not saying this is easy. In fact, it'll be the hardest thing you'll ever do. Not because it takes more effort than anything else, like going to school or working for someone else, but it's because we're dealing with us. And a brain can sometimes be a little funny. It can be your friend or it can be your enemy. <laughs> exactly. Now, here's the catch. Oh, there's a catch. I knew there was a catch. There's always a catch. No one can come up with this to-do list for you. What? That would be way too easy. That would be cheating. <laughs> but the good news is that wouldn't be nearly as fun either. It or fulfilling. It wouldn't be fulfilling. It wouldn't be exciting. There would be no point to it. Okay, you make a lot of money. But yeah. <laughs> I, say, I can see some point well, to it. Okay. One of our primary objectives here is always empowerment. Tara and I could start, scale, and automate a successful business in any industry from anywhere in the world. Our goal is to get you inside of our brain and empower you so you can do the same thing. Once you understand a few concepts, you'll be able to think like a business freak as well. <laughs> Remember, your to-do list is always going to be changing and adapting, but you've got to start somewhere. So in order to help you come up with your to-do list, we're gonna go through the seven phases of a business so you can identify where you currently are and where you need to go next. We'll also give you an idea of how long each one of these phases should take so you can stay on track. You ready, baby cakes? Yep, this is the process we have used time and time again to create seven-figure businesses. Phase one is the discovery phase. This is where you determine what product or service you will be selling. The product or service that is going to put you on the map, that is going to help you make the mega millions, that is going to give you financial independence and help you live a rich life of abundance. Wow, that is a lot of pressure. And bring world peace to the world. Hope you have some really good ideas <laughs> of figuring this out because, wow. So basically, we came up with six different ways to come up with your big idea. You only need one, but we gave you six, so you're welcome. We're very kind. So number one, go with your gut. A lot of times people will come to us and they already have an idea. That might be you. So many people have ideas, they just haven't implemented that idea. They haven't sold that idea. They haven't brought it to life. So if you already have a big idea, don't overanalyze this. Go with the thing that you want to do. And once again, a lot of times people get worked up and they think, oh, I need to do all this product research. And at Millionaire University, one of the things we teach is you don't need to take a ton of time figuring out what it is that you want to do. Now, if you're going to start this huge startup and raise $100 million and come up with a 200-page business plan, then yes, you're going to need to do more product research ahead of time. But for us, what we'd like to do is we like to figure out the thing that we're going to do. We'd like to start selling that thing right away, and that is your product research. Also, if you pick something that someone else is already doing something similar to, Great. that's your product research. <laughs> because <laughs> It's working. Yeah, it's already working. There, There's your product research. They're selling it. It's working for them. And the truth is to us, it's usually more of a marketing and sales message. I can't tell you how many businesses that we've started or tried to start. And at the beginning, it was off. And we easily could have been like, oh, the market research didn't work or no one wants this thing because they're not buying it. It's not going the way we planned. It must be the market. It must be our product. It must be something. It's no, it's always been our need to sell it better. We had to tweak something and then all of a sudden, oh, that worked. I mean, it seems like every business we start, it takes us a good several months before we really start to see traction in sales. Not that we can get any sales at all, but that's usually about what it takes. But the key is 
figure out what product you're going to sell and try to figure it out quickly. Like how fast do you think it should take to figure out your product or your idea? I would give yourself one to two weeks. No, that's way too long. Okay. I would give yourself two days. No, way too long. Okay. Five minutes. <laughs> At first I was thinking 24 to 48 hours, but now I'm like, give yourself like an hour. If you already know what it is, good. Write that down. Question for you. Okay. So I think you could easily make a decision on, I can make money selling this product in an hour. I think the hardest part is, do I want to commit to this business for the rest of my life? Dun, dun, dun. How do you handle that? So yes, first of all, let me clarify. Come up with the thing that you want to do. You might know it right now, or you might take the next hour or two going through some of the steps that we're going to talk to you about. And then come up with that thing, write it down, plan on doing that thing. But if you sleep on it and you think of something else, that's fine. That's the whole point of this is unlike school, you have to decide what you want to do when you're like eight years old. Okay, not really. But you have to decide what you want to do. And then you go and study that thing for many years. And then what happens if you change your mind? All this time and money wasted and you feel like a failure, really. Totally. Or you have the golden handcuffs and you hate what you do. Our philosophy is if you change your mind in a week, it doesn't matter. You can change your mind anytime. Write down the thing that you want to do. Go with your gut. If you change your mind, change it at any time. Now there's a difference between being fickle and not being focused and not being committed and changing your mind. Because some people, they get excited with the idea. There's like dopamine that's released when we just think about ideas and we get excited about ideas. So you want to make sure you're not doing that. My point is you can come up with your idea and you can easily pivot, change it up, adapt as you go. That's why I say, give yourself less time. Because if you take a week or two or three or a month or a few months to come up with your idea, you're really just stalling. There's a fine line between squirrel moments where you're doing your business and you get into it and you go, oh, this is hard. I should try something else. Usually that's a squirrel moment. You're just afraid of doing the hard work. Every business is challenging. Every business has its obstacles. But there's also a fine line between pivoting because there's a better situation, a better option, a different thing that you want to sell in a different way. And so the goal is to take action quickly so you can start to learn the difference between squirrel moments and intentional, intelligent pivot. Yes. Okay, so once again, the first one is go with your gut, aka you probably already have an idea. You probably already have something that you're passionate about, that you're thinking about, an idea that you've had in the past. But go with your gut. If you have an idea, write it down, get to work, and you need to start selling the heck, the H-E double hockey sticks, because hockey sticks are hey, important in business. That is <laughs> You want symbolic. the hockey stick effect. <laughs> I like that. So start selling the hockey sticks out of that thing. Let's go. Okay, number two. If your gut is not telling you what to do, you're going to have to get a little more creative, which is simply write a bunch of things down on a piece of paper that you're interested in. What are your strengths? What are the experiences that you've had? What are the things that you've studied? Your past or current job, sports you played, things you've collected. What are you into? Boom. So like Tara said, take a piece of paper and on one side, write all the things that you're good at, that you have experience in. And the other side, write all the things that you are interested in. And then what things on your list match up. So if there's something that you are good at and you're interested in, then that's where I would go. Because one of the keys to being successful in your business is to remove as much friction points as you possibly can. So if you're already familiar with something, that's going to save you so much time. And if you're passionate about something, it goes without saying, you're going to be a lot more excited. Take us, for example. What is one of the things I enjoy more than anything? You love well, to teach. Yeah. You love to talk about business. You love business. <laughs> yeah. I love talking about business. So if we were doing a podcast on fixing house items. On fixing things around the house, that podcast would be really boring because you wouldn't have much to say about it because mostly that's my job. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, it'd be really boring, but I wouldn't be compelled to do it. So once again, this doesn't have to be overly complicated. And then once you've narrowed it down to anywhere from one to three topics, then just start searching. I mean, don't take for granted what we have. You can look up any topic and find out so much information about it. So once you come with that topic, do a search in Google, look on YouTube, look up different podcasts, look at different people who have businesses that are similar to that topic. So for example, something I've really struggled with is my mental health. That doesn't sound good. That doesn't sound right, does it? But it, it doesn't <laughs> feel right. I'll tell you what. So I've had to learn all kinds of things about mental health, mindset, anxiety, depression, panic attacks, all these things I've struggled with. And I really fell in love with that space. And so I've done some coaching around that. It wasn't something I was necessarily interested in or wanted to have to go into, but I did fell in love with it. And I've done some work in that space. And so sometimes it can even come from your weakness, not necessarily your strength. And how cool is that? I mean, that was a hard time, but you took that weakness and you turned it into a strength. 
that's super cool. That actually leads us into number three. Pick a skill or a topic and spend a lot of time studying and becoming familiar with that topic, and then you can teach that thing to other people. So for Tara, she learned a lot about depression and panic attack. And anxiety. And, and anxiety. All those fun things. As she learned about those things, she was able to overcome those things, and then naturally she was able to teach people about those things. I think after this year, you and I could be marriage counselors. I think so. As well. we, <laughs> We've done a lot that's of been that. an area of weakness we really had to learn a lot about. <laughs> right? <laughs> and now there are days where I think we need therapy, and there are days when I think we could give therapy. <laughs> What's so. today? I think we're doing pretty good today. The <laughs> That's the great days. thing about having a business is it forces you to change into the person you really want to become because you're very highly motivated. It's something you want to do. You're providing for your family. And so it really forces you to be the person you really want to be. And I have changed so much through having a business. It's one of the intangible things people don't really talk about, but it is true. To continue with number three, pick a topic or skill and spend some time becoming really good at that. Who are some people, Tara, that you know of who have done this? Oh, I'm thinking about your sister with Janella Bay. She really loved sewing and making swimsuits. And so she started to create these swimsuits and they have a full blown, a very successful online business selling modest swimsuits. It's incredible. With online just a and small interest she was into. And brick and mortar. I mean, they have yeah, that's right. seven or eight physical locations as well. Yeah, yeah, they've absolutely killed it. That's a that's a great example. Another one is a book I recently read by a guy named James Clear. He recently wrote a book called Atomic Habits. Many of you have probably heard of it or read it, but he twice a week started blogging about habits. <laughs> That's what he His blogged about. His whole career is built on teaching people about habits. So he learned a ton about habits, started blogging on it, and then he's been able to write a book and create a very successful business around the topic of habit. Who else? I mean, we're all familiar with Brene Brown. She spends her whole career talking about vulnerability, researching vulnerability. I mean, it's incredible. You got Russell Brunson. He's the funnel guy. John Lee Dumas, podcasting. Another thing I would recommend, if someone doesn't know what business they want to start and they like marketing, I would recommend they pick a marketing niche and get really good at that. And then they use that as their business. So in this instance, you pick the thing and you actually, this time you would have to study it a little bit more. But if you study, for example, what's a marketing niche that someone could study and become an expert in? I mean, maybe you could become a website builder. You're not totally sure what you want to commit to as a career or something for the next few years or however long you do want to do it. You pick a skill instead. I'm going to build websites. I'm going to market that skill, become really good at that as I'm trying to decide what business I really want to take on the long term. Now, the cool thing is to build a website, like Tara has built several websites. These days, you don't have to know how to code, right? Like, because no. some people who build websites, that's what they do. So yes. some people out there who know how to code, like, oh, that takes a long time to learn how to code, but you don't have to. Another thing is a YouTube ads expert. If someone were to study YouTube ads for a week, if you took 40 hours or maybe two weeks and took 80 hours of studying YouTube ads, you would know more about YouTube ads than like 99.9% .9 of the world. And then what you could do is you could go to anyone, like you and myself, and you could say, hey, can I try this out? And maybe you offer to work for them for free for a couple of weeks to see if you can get a result. And then those people will pay you. And then once you get paid by one person, you can work for multiple people and you can literally start your own agency that could be up and running within a month or two. Or you could take those skills and you could apply it to your own business. You could take any kind of physical product or any kind of educational product or any software, and you can sell it based on these marketing skills that you've learned. Or maybe you decide to take another two weeks and learn another marketing niche. And you continue to grow that way. Yeah, you can stack your skills if you learn how to build websites or do paid advertising or whatever it is. These skills that you're learning, they're not a waste of time. They're very valuable skills. And then you can stack those skills and apply them in your own business. So it's a smart tactic if you're not totally sure what business you want to dive into. Okay, number four. What is a tool or service or product that you really like, but you think it could be better? So for example, if there's a software that you use on a regular basis, but maybe you feel like there could be some improvements. The other day I was talking to my brother, who's a partner in the Janela Bay business that we were talking about. They use Shopify every day in their business. And while he likes some things about it, there's some things he really wishes that it had or some things that it could do better. And so he was trying to convince us to create a new Shopify with some of the new and improved features that he feels like it needs. Now, we don't currently have time for that, but maybe one of you can run with it and he'll be your first customer. Just reach out to me if you need his number. Trey, who's a software developer and one of our current partners in our software company that does review automation, the other day he mentioned that there are some improvements he'd like to make to Slack. And I don't know if you guys know, but Slack recently sold for a whopping $27.7 with a B dollars to Salesforce. Wow. So if Trey thinks there could be some improvements made, 
Cha-ching. And the cool thing is you don't have to create a company that's worth $27.7 billion. You just have to get enough people to sign up or enough people to buy your product that help support your lifestyle. I know we talked about Janelle Bay a couple times, but my sister, she saw a problem with swimsuits. She couldn't find any modest swimsuits that she felt were also cute and fashionable. So she decided to start making them and now her and her husband have a multi-million dollar business selling modest swimsuits. Changing the world one modest swimsuit at a time. <laughs> Speaking of swimsuits, I mean, you think about it, one of the most basic things, cookies, cookies and swimsuits go together really well. They do. They took cookies, modified them, made them extra delicious and deliverable, and that company, Crumble, is killing it. They are killing it. And then other companies saw what Crumble was doing, and they probably thought, hey, I can make this better. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not quite as good, but still make some money from it. Or you can be in a certain industry. So, for example, when I met Justin, he was selling Satellite Dish Network door-to-door. -door. He didn't necessarily change your product, but he decided he wanted to own his own business. And that's the first business that we started together. And so we thought we could sell this better. We could do this better. And we started a business on our own. Take Millionaire University. How did Millionaire University start? We saw a problem. We had a need and we decided to do something about it to improve upon the current education system that is out there. I realized I was complaining about the college education system a lot. So then we started looking into options online. And there's a lot of people out there that are selling a lot of things, but none of them really fit what we were looking for. The online world can be really daunting and no one is really taking you down this path. And we also have kids who will be graduating from high school soon. And we're asking ourselves, do we send them to college to waste their time and money? Or do we send them to the online world where it's really daunting and they'll just get overwhelmed and not know what to do? So we felt like there are some semi-good options out there. But the truth is most of the people that I was seeing were kind of trying to put you into a box that fit what they were trying to sell you. So our goal with Millionaire University is to help people figure out what it is that they want to do and then help keep them going on that path. So once again, think of a product, a service, something that you use, a tool, anything that you feel like could be improved upon. And that could be your big idea. All right. Numero cinco. Number five is, okay, I don't know what I want to do. I'm not sure where to start. I'm not totally sure what I'm interested in. Then guys, just Google it. I remember when we had one of our businesses pretty streamlined. Justin had some free time on his hands. He'd been surfing and he realized he was bored out of his mind, even though he thought that was his dream. And he wanted to learn about online marketing. And one day he figured out that there are these things called a podcast. So he started listening to all of these podcasts. And I cannot tell you how excited he was. He would come out of the office like, Tara, there are people online telling you exactly what they're doing in their businesses. And he just was listening to podcast after podcast after podcast. You can get so many ideas. He was obsessed. So literally go to Google. Google, what are some different business ideas out there? Now, be careful. You might come across some shysty people trying to sell you a get-rich-quick thing or something like that. There's a lot of great information out there. The online world is not what it used to be many, many years ago. You can read blogs, check out YouTube, check out podcasts. There's amazing information about different opportunities that are available now. And just listen to what different people are doing in their business and write 20 to 50 different things that different people are doing and see if something stands out to you. Okay, last but not least is number six. Ask people that you know, maybe someone in your family, someone in your community, ask them about a business that they already have or are doing well in or they have been successful in. Be careful with this because sometimes people's opinions can be strong and they can be off, but it can be an amazing thing to ask someone who is in an industry that you're interested in, what's it like? How did you get there? What are you doing that's working well? What's the lifestyle? So let's go ahead and do a quick recap, shall we? Number one, just go with your gut. Number two, on a piece of paper, write down your strengths and things that you're interested in. See what overlaps, see where you want to go, and see what's already pulling you. Number three, pick a skill or a topic that you think you could be interested in. Really dive into it, study it as much as you can for a week or two. And then an instance of if it's like a marketing skill, you can do that marketing for someone else and then build out from there, or you can do it for your own product or service. Number four, figure out a tool, service, or product that you can improve and make better. Number five, ask Google. And number six, pick the brain of other successful people who have businesses that you are interested in. So I think the biggest point we want to make here is you do not need this crazy new original idea. In fact, it's probably a lot better if you don't. I can't tell you how often someone has come to Tara or myself and they're like, hey, I've got this idea for this business. It's almost like they won't even tell us what it is because they're nervous that someone's going to find out. Anytime I hear this, I'm very concerned because if you don't tell anyone about your business, no one's ever going to be able to buy it from <laughs> you. That's the whole point of marketing and sales. If it really is this crazy original idea, then I'm like, ah, oh, that's going to be difficult. That's going to be a hard uphill battle. 
good luck with that because I just like to copy people. <laughs> I know Tara says it's illegal, but I don't think it is. So it I think it is. You do it <laughs> well, the wrong way. You don't copy, you just do research. And anyway, okay. But the bottom line is there's millions of people out there making tons of money. You can just see a combination of a bunch of different things that a lot of people are doing and try a different variation. Put in your message, your product, your voice, what works for you, and go, go do it. You're going to start researching other people's companies and you're going to have your own, in a way, original ideas because they're the way you see the world and you're the only one who sees it that way. So you're the one who can teach from that way or sell from that way. Mm, preach. Another thing is if you come up with this big, huge, crazy idea or you're going to have this big, huge product development, you're risking a lot more capital up front. Anyway, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but we'll talk more about this kind of stuff as we go on. And if you do have a big idea and you do want to risk capital, go right ahead. We're just saying you just don't have to. Totally. It depends on your situation. If you started lots of businesses before, if you've got a million bucks sitting in the bank or investors that are just ready to go and you have a lot of business background, you've done startup. Awesome. I feel like a lot of people don't get into business because they look at it as this big, scary thing that they don't know what to do, or they have to come up with this crazy original idea, invest millions of dollars in their entire life savings. But that's just not the case. It doesn't have to, and in many cases, shouldn't be that way. All right. Phase two, the learning and the research phase. I love this phase. It's like you're an FBI agent and you're going to go to your competitors or other people in your industry and you're going to check out what they're doing. This is where you learn all you can about your product, your industry, or the skill that you're trying to develop and market. This phase should take about one to two weeks. You're going to be searching all about the product, category, skill, whatever it is that you need to learn about what it is that you're going to be selling. So you're pretty sure that you know that you want to sell dog toys. You'd want to begin your search by searching dog toys. Wow, you're smart. I know, I'm so smart. And you'll see all these companies that are selling dog toys. How are they doing it? What ads are they running? What is their website like? What other things are they selling on their website? Check out websites, blogs, videos, podcasts, but don't get too distracted by all those cute dog videos. Did you know there are actually tools that allow you to spy on your competition? Ooh. We sometimes use this tool called SEM Rush. You'll see examples of different ads that people are running and the different ways that they are marketing in your industry. It's pretty cool. So maybe check out between five to 10 companies. With a few of them, you'll probably want to go deep into and really check out what they're doing. And then the rest, just kind of see what's going on a little more surface level. Now, this is something you're going to be doing ongoing, but this is just to get you started. You'll also want to see if there is anyone teaching how to sell in your industry or niche. You can check out podcasts, video blogs, similar things. They might be teaching you specifically how to sell what you're trying to sell. So in one situation, you're basically checking out your competition to see what they're doing. And then the other situation, you're trying to find videos, blogs, podcasts that teach how to do the thing that you're trying to sell. Now, I got a question for you, Tara. What if I can't find someone who is teaching how to sell dog toys? Okay, so in that case, you want to cast a wider net, and you can do that in two ways. You'll take your topic and go a little broader and look for someone who is selling pet products. Maybe not dogs necessarily, but someone who's having success selling in the pet industry and research what they are doing. Or since you're selling physical products, you can find someone who's teaching about e-commerce and the practices that they're using that are helping them to be successful in their e-commerce business. Remember, this phase should take one to two weeks. Do they have to take one to two weeks? Oh, no. In fact, if you're ready to go, just go. These phases are not meant to limit you, slow you down. They're just guidelines, mostly for those who aren't moving forward because they're too scared. They're getting analysis paralysis. Our goal is to help you analyze, research, get great information, get motivation, but do not stop. There is momentum to creating a business. Speaking of, what do you got for us, Vanna, Tara, Y.E.? <laughs> yeah. I don't uh, want a fancy what? dress. Oh. But oh. phase three is kind of fun. It's like your build creation phase. You're going to create your minimum viable product. Basically the bare minimum of what you have to have to start marketing and selling your product. This is where you get creative with your brand, your copy, the content that you're going to put out there or the product. You're putting together the things that you need to sell what you are going to sell. Do you need a website? What social media platforms are you going to be using? What services or platforms do you need to set up to sell your products online? Now, <laughs> that sounds like a lot. It really is just kind of what are the assets you need to build in order to put this thing out to the world? And then you'll grow and evolve with them. They'll get better over time. But what are the basics that you need to get out there to get you guys going? And this phase should take about two to four weeks, depending on what you're selling and what assets you need to set up. Take MU, for example. We set up our business entity, our podcast, the social media platforms we wanted to use, created a website, a training for you guys, an email series. And that is our minimum viable product. 
And once again, there could be a range. If you're raising a bunch of capital and you're gonna create this really cool product overseas and you have to create the mold and all these different things, we're just saying, don't take a ton of time creating the assets that you need to sell this. We're giving you some time to do it, but not a ton of time. For us, every business we started, it took some time. Really the trickiest part of this phase is the content, the things that you wanna say and how you wanna say them, how you wanna position yourself and what angles you're gonna take. I can make websites all day long, but the content and how we wanna show ourselves to the world is what takes some thinking in this phase. You may not be doing a lot of content marketing from the beginning. You might be doing some very direct sales, in which case you might be able to get going right away. It might only take you a few days, but maybe you gotta like bake some cookies and look up some recipes, or maybe you gotta order some product, or maybe you gotta get some ads going, or maybe you have a software idea and you gotta reach out to your buddy who knows how to code and he's gotta get going on creating the minimal viable product, also known as your MVP. So basically there's gonna be some things that you gotta get going. Now, once again, okay, it might take longer to create that software product, especially if you have a full-time job or something, right? We're kind of assuming that nobody works or does anything or has anything going on. <laughs> so obviously you're working a full-time job. You're gonna be trying to fit these into little spots of your life. And if you have a family and kids, it's going to be tricky, but we have seen people do this time and time again, even though they have a full-time job. Might be a bit of a hustle, but it changes their life if they're willing to do it. I don't really love the term hustle because it usually means people working 80 hours a week and not being seeing their family and being out of balance. That's not what we're talking about. But sometimes when you have that initial lift, sometimes you do got to put in a little extra time, but you also want to make sure you're taking care of yourself and your family. All right. Phase four. Sales and marketing. This is where the rubber meets the road, baby. This is everything. And this is what will separate those who are successful from everyone else. That is the lifeblood of your business. And it's probably the hardest part. It's the thing that people hear the most. That is where most businesses go to die before they even get started. Oh, it's so sad. But I also know if we can help people overcome those fears and concerns and help them figure out their sales and marketing process or system, it only takes one to bring their product or service to the world. And that will change their life forever. And it will change the lives of the people that they connect with. And we're not going to beat around the bush. It is going to be challenging. You're probably going to want to quit about 100 times. There is no, if you build it, they will come. So where do we begin? Okay. There are four different things that you want to consider when coming up with your marketing and sales strategy. So what we have for you today is we have the four P's of marketing <laughs> and sales. P, 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 P. Okay, so first thing you want to consider is your personality. If you like talking like me, then maybe you'll do some direct sales. Maybe you'll hop on the phone and call a bunch of people. Maybe you'll do a podcast. If you like the limelight, maybe you'll do a video. If you're a little more introvert, what do introverts do, Tara? I'll tell you what introverts <laughs> do because that's more my area of expertise. Introverts are powerful personalities in the business space, but we might do things a little bit differently. So for example, I'm on a podcast. Was that easy to do? No, that was slightly torturous. The very first one that I ever mm, did. And I still remember. sometimes I'm like, ah. but well, you like things a little more written out. I'm like, let's go, let's do this. And you're like, wait, wait, what are we going to talk about? Yes. <laughs> so even the way you go about doing it will be different as well. Exactly. So I like a little more structure. I like to plan things out. I like to finish things that are started. Justin's more here and there and all around, but he has awesome and ideas. And everywhere and she loves it. <laughs> he has a lot of ideas. He'll talk to anybody. He can bring the high energy where I'm more watching, thinking, being analytical. I would much rather be on a podcast than at a party trying to do sales or networking or hopping on a phone and saying, hey, you want to buy my thing? But I do enjoy selling on a podcast. I will do webinars. I will do websites. And so there are a lot of different things that you can do as an introvert, but we just might do it a little differently. Introverts also might do more blogging and you kill on websites. Yeah, you might want to sell a product where you don't have to show your face whatsoever or your voice or anything. Maybe you want to find people who are going to sell. Like you don't mind selling them the vision, but you don't necessarily want to be the one pounding the phones all day. Another thing to do with personality is your ability to handle risk. Justin has a really high risk tolerance. Mine was quite low. So we've both learned how to work together. So just your ability to handle risk will also really depend on the strategies that you use. Are you going to quit your job, have nothing in the bank, start this business bare boned and get going? Or do you have a job? Are you going to have some savings? Are you going to build this thing up slowly after work? It really Wait, depends that, that on how you our, like to you're go. You're going to our next one, Tara. Oh, oh sorry. But, okay, that, that's a good segue. What is the next P the next in our P four Ps? Is Tara can't read my writing. <laughs> I can't read your Don't you have these memorized? Come on. The second one is your personal situation. 
Are you working a job? Are you married? Are you single? Do you have income coming in? You Do have, you have monies. Any savings? Oh, you have no monies. Do you have capital? No capital. How much time have you got? So how might someone's personal situation affect how they go about doing their sales and marketing? Well, darling, oh. <laughs> if someone has a lot of time, but they don't have a lot of money, they're more likely to do what we refer to as brute force marketing. In our first business, that's pretty much all we did. Yeah, we were in debt. We were in a pinch. You were out knocking doors while I was home with our new baby. We didn't have a lot of money. We had negative money. We had time. That's all we, we had. had. Time. I didn't have a job. That's what we were doing. And it worked amazingly. I mean, we got ourselves out of a hole pretty quickly because you were willing to knock the doors and I was willing to do everything else in between. Back was against the wall. Uh-huh. I was willing and I was able to do that. My personality fit that profile enough to where I could do it. Another example of this is a guy I met the other day when I was playing pickleball, Bill, that started... The Perfect Bar? Perfect Bar. So Bill actually just retired. I think he sold his company for like $150 million. Most of you have probably heard of Perfect Bar. They sell it in just about every grocery store. Growing up, he had 20 siblings, like something crazy. Like, I'm not even joking. <laughs> Insane he had amount. 20 siblings. No, I'm not kidding. It was a lot. He had tons of siblings, and his dad got sick, and they used to travel a lot. They made these treats. His dad was a health nut, and they called them daddy balls or something. Like that. <laughs> that doesn't. Wow. They obviously changed the name. He called it Perfect Bar. And he just went to every Whole Foods until he finally got someone who's like, these are pretty good. Go take some. And at that time, nobody was doing snacks like this. It took up fridge space. It was very valuable space. But he got someone to buy it. They loved it. People started buying them and then it just took off. He was telling me, he's like, man, I just hit the pavement. Like he did some major brute force to make that work. So once again, brute force marketing, basically you don't have any money. You're going to do whatever it takes. Make a list of people, start emailing people, start calling people, reaching out to all your connections just every day. Just start hitting it hard. And if you can do this, you'll succeed at anything. If you can go brute force route, you really can do anything because I would say it's the most challenging. But man, anybody out there who can do brute force, props to you. Anyone out there who's in a sales job right now, props to you. Anytime someone tells me, especially a young person, I'm working in sales right now, I'm always like, oh, that is the best. I wish I would have done that. If you can sell, you can really do anything. You really can. And once again, that's not something you have to do forever. But it's a great way to get going. And just like the perfect bar guy, he was more of the brute force personality, but his siblings helped him and they were able to do some of the other things that he needed in the areas that he lacked. Now, let's say you have a job, you have a little more money, but you don't have a lot of time. In this case, you may not be as heavily focused on putting a lot of time into brute force marketing yourself personally, but maybe you hire someone to do that for you. Or you create a video or webinar that sells your product or service for you. And you more heavily focus on paid advertising, such as Facebook ads or pay-per-click. So what if you don't have time or money, or you want to be a little more frugal with your money? In that case, you can hire salespeople that work for commission only, or you can partner with someone who can do the sales or is really good at marketing and is ready to implement. Maybe you're the visionary, you're the idea guy, and they're more of the implementer. And you guys can figure out a structure that makes sense for you. Another situational thing that you might want to consider is, do you have or need an office? I'm currently working with a couple who has always wanted to have a restaurant. And we spent quite a while looking for that perfect location for them. But between doing a lease and a build out and all the expenses that it would entail, it was just more than their budget could afford and a little more risk than they wanted to take at the early beginning. Now, I surprised Tara and I had these guys cater at her 40th birthday party. It was so good. So rather than go the restaurant route at the beginning and have all the high cost and overhead, I told them I should start a catering company. So that's what we've been working on and they're just getting going. They've already had a few gigs, but without all the overhead, all the money they make aside from the cost of the food will basically be pure profit. This week, we'll be getting them set up with our review automation software, Five Oak. Help them get a quick 30 to 40 reviews from all the people we know who have eaten their food and loved it. And soon Google search and word of mouth will take off and they'll be off to the races with little to no risk at all. So once again, as you're coming up with your marketing and sales plan, do what works for you and your situation. You don't have to be like anyone else. And that's part of what makes business so awesome. There's a million ways to make a million dollars and being you is the best thing you can do. All right, a little cheesy, I know, but it's true. The third P is product. What platform or sell strategy is ideal for your product? If I am doing an e-commerce business where I'm selling a physical product, one that's visual, it might be a great idea to grow an Instagram or Pinterest following. If I'm going to be doing a coaching or education business, a podcast might be a great place to start. Where are people hanging out that are interested in what you have to offer? Is it a forum? Is it a Facebook group? 
We know a guy who started a company called Diller Socket that sold software to car dealerships. So his company was constantly going to trade shows and hanging out at places where people who own and work for car dealerships were going. Our son Brogan is really into dragon fruit. So he has an Instagram following where he can talk about and sell dragon fruit cuttings. But it would be really cool if he started a YouTube channel where he could educate people all on dragon fruit while selling the cuttings as well. The possibilities are endless here, guys. Okay, the fourth P is people or peers, a.k.a. <laughs> your competition, or as we like to say, your co opetition So this one is huge, and this actually might be the most important and the one you want to spend the most time on. And it's the most fun, I think. Why, Tara? Because you get to spy on other people's stuff on and people see how cool and steal their from businesses them. are. I love it. <laughs> I think it's fascinating. The coolest thing about business is you don't really have to figure anything out on your own. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Everything has already been done. Bill Allen, who bought my other business for me, he would always say, I do not have one single original thought. I mean, I don't think that's totally true, but he just heard what other people are doing and he did that same thing, but did what worked for him in his own way. What we want you to do here is pick three to five people that are in the same niche as you or doing something similar. Now, maybe you've already found these people in your initial research and in coming up with your product, or maybe you're just already aware of these people or these businesses. But if you're not, that's okay. Easy peasy. Remember our good friend, Google? Uh, just do a simple Google search and look for other people who are selling a similar product or service as you. The goal here is to figure out the customer journey. How are they finding these people? How are they being marketed to? How are they getting to their website or their product? What are they buying? How are they buying? How much are they buying? Are they retargeting them? What is the process? What is the journey that customers are going through from being introduced to the product? How many touches does it take to where that person actually makes a purchase? And how do they continue to have them as a buyer in their business? Now, you may not be able to quickly identify all the ways that every single one of these people are getting all of their customers, but you can still get a pretty good idea. Now, not only do we want you to look for quote unquote competitors, as we'd like to say cooperators, because there's a lot of ways that you might end up working with these people. So keep that in mind, but also look for blogs, podcasts, YouTube videos, where people aren't only making money doing the thing that you want to do, but maybe they'll teach you how they do it. If you're really into photography, I bet you, you could find a lot of people out there that teach you how to create a business doing photography. Now, once again, if you can't find your exact niche, look for something that's similar. Business in general and marketing and selling your business is really just a matter of seeing what a lot of other people are doing, matching it with your personality and your situation and deciding what works best for you. I don't want to call it a Frankenstein because that sounds kind of like rah, not well put together, <laughs> a little janky. but you can really take bits and pieces of what other people are doing. Think about the things that you want to do and put those together. Come up with your message, come up with your unique selling proposition as they say, but just go and those things will come together over time. And remember, you're modeling these people, but you're not copying them. That's illegal. So just model, learn, educate, don't copy. Well, I don't know if it's like illegal, illegal, but it could be illegal. In a lot of instances, it can yeah. be if it's perfectly <laughs> exactly like they did it. But the truth is, if you take bits and pieces from everyone, no one is really coming up with anything 100% original, right? I mean, it's original because it's from you and you are special, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you are very We're special. all original, right? So the way we're going to do something is going to be very similar. But the truth is, you could look at what something that someone's doing in a certain way and you kind of like that. But yes, Tara's right. Don't take someone's exact marketing message or their exact website and copy that exactly. But if you take ideas from a bunch of different people and then you make it your own, boom, bada bing, bada boom. And you're gonna enjoy your business a lot more that way anyway. All right, so let's do a recap of recap, the four recap. P's. Number one, <laughs> personality. What are you into? What do you like? What are you naturally drawn to? These are important things to know and understand because they will lessen the friction points of you moving forward in your business, no which is important. Friction. No friction. <laughs> <laughs> are you on protest day? What's going on? Number two, what is your personal situation? You got some money. You got time. What do you got? You don't got nothing. Good luck. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Figure out what you do have. Everybody has assets. How are you going to use them? Yes, they do. Number three, what is your product or service and where are people selling it? Or what is the best way to sell it, depending on what it is. All right. Numero cuatro is people. Check out what your competition or your co-opetition, other people who are in the same niche or a similar niche, check out what they're doing, what's working for them. Write it down. Write them down. Give them a call. Maybe if you're single, ask them on a date. <laughs> and also, there might be some resources that teach you how to make money in the exact niche that you're trying to learn from. Check out a few of them because they're going to have different thoughts and you are you. So 
be you. I know Tara says not to steal. If you steal a little bit from everyone, no one will know who you're stealing from. <laughs> Do not steal. <laughs> Now that we've gone over a few things to consider when selling your product, we're going to take a look at the seven main ways that most businesses sell their product or service. Not to be confused with the seven phases of your business, which is the title of this course. Sales and marketing is so important that we wanted to take some extra time here. Just think of this as a bonus mini course within the course. There are a million ways to make a million dollars in business, and all you need is one. Now, I say one way, but what I actually mean is one combination of ways or one path. For example, let's say you're going on a trip. In any given trip, there's a certain combination of ways that it takes for you to get there. You walk from your house to your car, you drive your car to the airport, fly a plane to another airport, and then take an Uber or taxi to get to your main destination. Just like going on a trip, there's a journey that each customer takes before they end up buying your product or service. The system or process which you implement in your business that takes someone from not knowing that you exist to becoming a raving fan is often referred to as a funnel. When you think about a funnel, you probably think about something that is large at the top and smaller at the bottom. Usually the term top of funnel is what is used when a customer hears about your company for the first time. Middle of funnel is when they're trying to decide if they want to purchase your product or service. And bottom of funnel is what happens when someone buys from you and becomes an actual customer. This is essentially the process of you developing a relationship with your customer. Kind of like when you're dating, you're not just gonna go up to someone and say, hey, give me a smooch. First, you introduce yourself, then you shake your tail feathers, and then, just kidding. Now, another way to look at the bottom of the funnel is not necessarily just how many people become customers, but how much money they spend overall. It's a well-known fact that it's much easier to get repeat customers than it is new customers. So when I think of any of our businesses as funnels, this is how I do it. The number one goal is to have the bottom of the funnel, AKA where the money comes out, to be as large as possible. Now I wanna make sure when I say number one goal, it's clear that I'm not referring to, our number one goal is to just make money and not help people. That couldn't be further from the truth. I'm assuming everyone listening here has or will have a great product or service. So in actuality, the bottom of your funnel or the money that your company makes, in reality represents how many people you helped and served. Making money is just the end result of that. Okay, back on track. Now, unlike a funnel that you use for cooking and you might pour liquid through, the way we're looking at this funnel is that not necessarily everything you put in top is gonna come out the bottom. But what we do know is unless it goes in the top, it's impossible for it to come out the bottom. Is it just me or is this starting to sound like a strange anatomy lesson taught to kindergartners? As a business owner, you essentially have three goals. You wanna make the top of your funnel as big as possible. Because even though the only thing that matters is what comes out the bottom of your funnel, the bottom will never be bigger than the top. So goal number one, get as many people as you possibly can to become aware of you. Goal number two, get as many of those people who are aware of you to buy from you. Goal number three, way over deliver on what you promised and create an insanely amazing experience so they keep buying from you and tell everyone about you. Now, there are a few things to keep in mind when considering what a funnel for your business might look like. We discuss some of these things such as your personality, your personal situation, and what kind of product or service you'll be selling. Now, one of the keys to having a successful funnel is you want it to be profitable. And not only do you want your marketing and sales funnel to be profitable, but you want your entire business as it works with your funnel to be profitable. Now, I know you're probably saying, well, duh, isn't that obvious? But I wanna bring it up because the truth is this might be a little harder than you think to pull off. But if and when you do this and you can do it at scale, it is literally game over. Like that is everything. If you can figure out the right marketing and sales system where you make two to three, maybe $4 for every dollar you spend, and you're able to do that at scale, it's essentially like you've created a money printing press, legally though. Now, once again, just to reiterate, I'm not saying this to get you all like hyped up and rah, rah, like money, 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 and get rich quick and all this stuff because it's actually quite the opposite. To do this is really, really hard. It's gonna take a lot of time and effort. I just wanna make sure you understand what happens when you do do it. Do, do. Because you're gonna have to try a thousand things before you get to the thing that works or the set of things, the right combination of things that help you consistently grow your business in a profitable way. The truth is, is that the ideas are easy. I mean, we'll literally tell you what to do. All the information is at your fingertips. We live in the information age. The hardest part is the implementation. And it's not even that the implementation is hard, it's just that as an entrepreneur, you're not getting a paycheck. You're not getting this grade. You're not getting this thing every day to keep you on the track. 
and to keep you going. So it's so easy to give up on trying 99 when the next thing you do is the one thing that'll make everything work, everything come together. Okay, soapbox over. Let's move on to the seven things. Number one is a sales team. Depending on your business and marketing and sales model, these sales can be made door to door or on the phone. This is how we got our start. I was doing door to door sales for Dish Network and one day realized rather than work for someone else, I could do this on my own and make three times as much. Very easy transition. Didn't have to develop the product, didn't have to learn how to sell, just kind of plug and play. So essentially in this instance, the top of my funnel was how many doors could I knock? So to make the bottom of the funnel as big as possible, I just had to knock more doors and convert more of those doors I knocked to sales. Then as we recruited more people to help us sell, those numbers grew. A sales team is also the number one way we grow our review automation software company, Five Oak. Essentially, we have a couple people that are constantly calling companies that they believe could improve their business by getting more and better reviews. The main goal here is awareness. We want to get as many people as we can aware of our company, who we are, and what we do. Before receiving our call, in most cases, they probably had no idea we existed. So what we're doing here is we're giving ourselves a chance. From here, they fall into one of several buckets. They either hang up the phone or are not interested. <laughs> They're either semi-interested or just being polite and ask if we can send them more information which we do and then continue to follow up, or they're highly interested. In which case, they'll set up a time for a demo and to hopefully close the deal. If the deal doesn't close on the demo call, then we'll continue to follow up, et cetera, et cetera. The key to being wildly successful with a sales team is nail it, then scale it. If you or someone else can get your numbers dialed in on how many calls it takes or how many doors it takes and how long it takes to get X amount of sales and the messaging around that, and you can come up with a proven process or system that's scalable, and profitable for both your sales team and your business, then you are off to the races. From there, you basically write your own paycheck. It's a game of addition and multiplication to determine how much money you wanna make. Okay, you might need to develop some management and leadership skills somewhere in there as well, but you know, details. We'll get there, we'll get there. The next two ways companies grow their business are through content marketing and paid marketing. Content marketing is essentially what its name says it is. Things such as podcasts, blogs, YouTube channels, even TV and radio are all different forms of content marketing. The idea is to create a huge amount of value up front for any given audience. Once you have that attentive audience, you can either sell them products or services that fit their needs, or you can get other advertisers to pay you for commercials or advertising space. Now paid advertising is essentially the opposite. Rather than create valuable content for an audience, you're paying someone else to advertise to the audience that they've created. Some forms of this are things such as Google AdWords or pay-per-click, social media ads such as Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and LinkedIn. Other forms of paid advertising might be things such as direct mail, radio, billboards, or other signage, newspaper, if those still exist. You might pay someone to put up or hand out flyers for you. And the list goes on and on and on. The next one is relationship or influencer marketing also known as JV or joint venture marketing. This is essentially where you work with someone else who already has an audience that may be interested in your product or service, but rather than just pay them money up front, which essentially would be paid marketing and is also often done, you agree to some kind of profit share based on how that specific venture or offer goes. Working with other business owners or influencers is not just a great way to sell your product or service, but also a great way to build your general audience, which over time will turn into more customers and sales. The next two ways businesses sell their product or service is through physical storefront location or online partnership platforms. By storefront, I'm referring to actual physical brick and mortar locations. These are your restaurants or physical stores that sell retail products. Most medical type and many other businesses also fall into this category. We're talking about any business located on a street that has literal physical traffic driving by or any place with foot traffic, such as a mall. When we talk about online platforms, we're talking about places like Amazon, Etsy, or even Upwork. These could also include things like online forums and Facebook groups. When we moved, we used sites like TaskRabbit to hire cleaners, movers, electricians, and plumbers to help us get our house ready. The final way that successful companies grow their business is word of mouth marketing, which is essentially the result of what happens when your product or service is, well, awesome. When you deliver and over deliver on the promise you made your client and customer when selling them your product or service, the natural result will be they'll tell other people about it. And that's when business gets really fun.
I want to give some real life examples on how I've seen some of these strategies used together to create massive success in different kinds of businesses. Listen carefully while I share these and try to think of different ways that you can use these strategies to help you grow your business. When we created House Flipping HQ, our real estate investing education business, our main form of marketing was content marketing. We created value by creating a podcast where we shared our experience flipping houses and brought on other experts who shared their knowledge. We invited everyone on our podcast to go to our website or a landing page to join our weekly newsletter or get a free gift in exchange for their email. For several months, we gave a great deal of value through the podcast and our emails. So when we opened up the doors to our first online program, House Flipping Formula, we already had people lined up to buy. We'd already created that relationship. They knew, liked, and trusted us. So when we gave them that opportunity, for some of them, it was just a matter of how do I send you my money? Then for others, we did a webinar, which really broke down the benefits of joining the program. And we took time to answer their questions. Once we had the program going and knew that our clients were getting value out of it, we created some paid ads through Google and Facebook to drive additional traffic to our webinar. Now, these sales were a lot harder to convert because they didn't know us as well. But getting them to pay attention to us was easy. All we had to do was give someone else some money and they said, hey, go check this out. Now, on these paid ads, we didn't really care if we made a whole lot of money up front. Because if we could spend $1,000 on paid traffic and make $1,000 from selling our online program, we were still able to capture the attention and get emails of other people that we could then essentially add into our funnel, get them listening to our podcast, read our emails, and build a relationship with them over time, and eventually a percentage of those would end up becoming customers. Later on, we launched a higher ticket program for $25,000. Most of the people who joined this program were already customers of ours. We also had a few people join that were already a part of our audience, but hadn't yet purchased anything because they were a little higher level and didn't feel like our product was right for them. So essentially when you break it down, our funnel looked something like this. Top of funnel was our podcast and later on some paid traffic from Facebook and Google. These both led to getting their email and eventually getting them on a webinar, which would give them value and then sell our product, House Hoping Formula. House Flipping Formula and the email list and the podcast led some people to join our high-level $25,000 mastermind group. We would then interview our high-level clients on our podcast, where we sold tickets to a live event, which was put on mostly by our high-member clients, which allowed us to give a ton more value, build a ton of rapport, sell more of our programs, and the cycle just continued. And then get this, eight years after creating that very first podcast, we ended up selling that business to one of our very first high-level clients. The business is thriving. He's thriving, helping tons of people, and we receive a nice, healthy paycheck every month. And we're able to be here with you now. Business is a beautiful thing. Now, I know I went through that kind of quickly, and I want to be very clear here. None of that was easy. We wanted to quit a thousand times, just like every one of our other businesses. But it was so worth it. Also, once again, keep in mind, we did all of this over several years. You do not and you should not try to do all of this all at once. We started with a podcast and that was really hard and we had to figure out lots of things and we failed so many times and wanted to quit. And then after several months, we created a program and honestly, it wasn't quite the success right out of the gates as we hoped it would be, but then we kept building that and improving it. And then when we finally launched the high level program and made way more than we had previously, it was like, oh, okay, we had created this pent up demand and started to see this exponential growth, the hockey stick as they talk about, and it made everything worth it. But when you think about the funnel that we've talked about, when you think about top of funnel, it's like we had hundreds of thousands of people listen to our podcast and probably hundreds of thousands of people see our ads on Facebook or Google. From there, we had tens of thousands of people join our email list. Thousands watched the webinars, hundreds joined our lower level program and came to our events, and then a percentage of those joined our higher level programs. And eventually I brought on a sales team to help convert some of those warmer leads that we had gotten from people who expressed interest in our programs. So essentially, what did I cover there? We got content marketing, paid marketing, sales team, Oh, and we even did a bunch of interviews on other podcasts and JV partnerships to help to promote our brand and sell our products. Oh, and I was definitely mixing it up in forums and Facebook groups. That's a story for another day. But dang, I think that makes me like six for seven. Yeah, baby. Phew. Okay, I was going to go over a few other examples, but I think we've covered a lot for today. Once again, as a reminder, do not get overwhelmed. Your only goal is to figure out what strategy you think might work for you 
figure out the next steps that you think you need to take and take the next step and then take the next step and then adjust and pivot as you go. And be sure not to grade yourself just by the end result. Reward yourself for any actions you take regardless of the outcome. That's gonna release dopamine in your brain, which is gonna make you feel energized and excited and fulfilled and like you've accomplished something, which you have. And that's what will help you keep going. And if you keep going, eventually you will reach your dreams. Sales and marketing is ongoing. So there's not like a time limit we're gonna give you, but what I would say is give yourself what we call a 30 day push. What do we mean by this? Essentially, this is how you're gonna really get some traction in your business. Depending on what you're selling, I would write down every single person that you know of or every business that you can find Anyone who may possibly want your product or service, I would write their names down. I would get contact information for them. I would start calling. I would knock doors. I would email. I would text. I would do whatever it takes. I would reach out to people you know who might know someone who might be interested. You're going to do whatever it takes. You're going to get a ton of rejection. You're going to be okay with that rejection. Mm -hmm. You're just going to make it happen. Let's say you're going to do a car detailing business or a trash can washing business or a power washing business. Literally just go knock on a couple hundred doors a day. Take some flyers with you. Pass them out. Talk to everyone you know. Get people to put you in text groups and send you out to their friends. Within that 30 days, you literally might have enough clients to be financially free. And then you get referrals off of those people. Just hit it super hard. Now, I'm not saying after the 30 days to stop. We like to think in short waves, right? Mm -hmm. But by then you're going to have some momentum. You're going to have some traction. And it's going to feel easy. You're going to be making money. And you're going to get over some hesitancy. So you'll feel a little more confident. You'll see things working. You'll get traction. That momentum will continue to build. It'll be a beautiful, beautiful thing. There are also many, many services that you can use to help you with this. There are so many lists of every single industry you can think of where you can just call people, go to the business. If you're selling business to business, if you're selling a home service, the houses are everywhere, right? Just go. <laughs> if you're selling online, you'd focus more on ads or podcasting or YouTubing or webinars or SEO. In our software business, we use a service called Zoom Info to find out about local businesses that might be interested in our service. In an instance like that, you can also easily do a Google search and find all kinds of businesses that are close by that you can call or stop by. Anyway, bottom line, in any industry, in any niche, in anything you're doing, there are a number of people that you can call that either want your product directly or they might know of people who have them or they might be an influencer in your area and they might know people who want your product. If you're selling doggy toys, find other people who have dog groups on Facebook or forums or they might sell other products that might complement yours and see how you can work out a venture with them. But just go, 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 go. Because most of the time you're going to get a no. It's not going to work out. You're going to have people that you're going to follow up with that might be interested later on. But you've got to be able to handle this rejection. Do not look at it as rejection. Don't look at it as failure. It's not personal. It's not personal. Yeah, just give yourself a big, huge pat on the back. Have your goal be to reach out to a thousand people versus make a ton of money at this point. If you will do this, it will change your life. You will learn a ton from it. You'll learn resilience and it'll be great. Now, once again, if you just don't feel like there's any way you're going to do this, then that's fine. Maybe your angle is more of, of a blog or a podcast or a sales letter and you're going to drive some paid traffic to it. That's fine. Or maybe you find someone who's going to sell for you. Whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. Ah. Is this what it sounds like to be in your brain? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's move on. Phase five, fulfill it. Deliver on the product or service that you have promised. In every business that we've had, this phase has just come naturally. When we need to fulfill it, we prepare how to fulfill it and we figure it out and we deliver on what we promised. And it comes way easier after you've done one through four. This is the easier part. Well, let's give a few examples. Dish Network. Okay, we knew we had to fulfill on that right away. So we had to have the satellite dishes and we had to have someone who was going to go and install those. So We that, had to have professional installers. So we had them ready. So that was a little different. When we had our real estate investing business, our number one goal was to get a house. And then once we got the house, then we figured out how to fix the house. And then over time, we figured out how to systematize. But none of that came before we did the first few steps. And then same with the education business. We didn't totally know how to fulfill until we started doing our marketing and sales. And so we had to give an idea of what we were going to sell, but we always would sell something and then would create the course or the program as we went. Could you imagine trying to create all of that ahead of time? I don't think it ever would have happened. No, it you'd never be burnt out, out before it even got out there. And then with Millionaire University, what if we tried to do and create all of the things that we have in mind for Millionaire University from day one? <laughs> 
Like it's crazy to even think about, right? It would feel like a huge behemoth that would be really heavy and overwhelming and we'd probably stop because there's not a lot of momentum in this huge overwhelming project. It's piece by piece by piece getting it out there, and then moving with it. And I don't think we would have known totally what to do because we have an idea or a vision of what we think we want to do, but I'm sure we'll be doing some adjusting and pivoting. And we've already done a lot of that since we started the podcast. You don't have to have this perfect customer service department. For 5 Oak, we're barely now talking about a customer service department. You don't have to have all these things dialed in from the beginning, or it's just not going to work. Okay, phase six, grow it, nail it, then scale it, baby. Yeah, yeah. We've already covered a lot today, so we're going to keep these last two phases pretty short. And then we can dive into these in detail more over time. The truth is, right now, just take action. Figure out what it is that you're going to sell and then sell it. In fact, that is how you grow. We're always telling our clients that the first sell is way, way, way harder than the next 10. And the first 10 are way, way harder than the next 100 and so on. In fact, in a nutshell, that is how you grow and scale. You figure out how to sell something once, and then you duplicate that process 10 times. And then you have other people help you duplicate that process. You start to create processes and systems. You leverage tools, software, and other people's time. You continue to dial in on your marketing message and strategies. Word of mouth starts coming together for you. Maybe you start to get some great reviews online. You now have customers and clients who are raving fans who are excited about what you have to offer. You can get testimonials. Maybe you can now hire an assistant who can do all of the things for you that you really don't love doing or that take a lot of your time that you can easily outsource to someone else. Okay, I know I kind of said a lot there really quickly, but the best thing you can do right now to grow your business is just start selling, keep selling, Figure out every way you can to get your message out to the world as quickly as possible and keep track of what it took to do that. If you're calling people, how many people did you have to call? What kind of people did you call? This is the hardest part of growth because you've got to figure out these numbers so that you can grow. And the truth is, it's really not that hard. We make it hard, but you don't have to. So don't. Let's go. Let's do it. What are you waiting for? Come on. Day seven, sell and or automate. So phase seven just represents when you've gotten to the point where you have grown your business and there is automation. For us, our goal is always to create a business that can essentially work without us or can work without very much involvement from us. You've worked hard. I mean, this takes a while, in most cases, several years. Depending on what you're doing, it doesn't have to take that long, but just saying it takes a while, it takes a lot of work. So at that point, you can kind of go into like a maintenance mode where it's like you've built this machine that works, but you still have to maintain it and keep an eye on it. I and mean, of course, you can hire like a CEO and, and all of that, but there's still some attachment for the most part. Or you can decide to sell. I mean, if you're like me and you have ADD and you get lots of ideas and you'd like to try new things, then maybe you can move on from that business, pass the torch on to someone else who can carry on what you've built. In a lot of cases, they might even be able to carry that on even better than you. But it's a great spot to be in because you'll have a lot of flexibility, a great residual income, and then you can choose to still stay a part of it or sell it and move on to the next thing. Once again, we'll continue to talk about these things, but we just wanted to take some time and go through those steps and really give you an idea of the entrepreneurial journey. Okay, so a quick recap. Phase one is the discovery phase. Determine what product or service you are going to sell. Phase two is the learning and research phase. Learn as much as you can about your product so you can sell it. Phase three is the build and creation phase. Create your minimal viable product. Phase four, sell that thing. Sell the heck out of that baby. Phase five, fulfill it. Phase six, grow and scale it. And then phase seven, automate, or if you want, sell it. Woo! All right, we did it. We did it. Yeah, baby. You did it. We did it. Let's go, everybody. Just remember, mm. your business is just a to-do list. That's it. What phase are you in? What do you need to do next? That's it. One step at a time. Sometimes it's just eliminating all the extra stuff. What is the thing you want to sell? Sell it. Take it one step at a time. Adjust as you go. And you can do this. We believe in you. And we're going to be here for you. Yes. Every step of the way. Check into the podcast. Subscribe to our newsletter. We ain't going to be sending out no spam and no junk mail. We're going to be sending some good stuff to keep you on track. We're going to be here for you, sharing everything with you that you need to be able to do consistent and persistent. Boom, boom. Pretend like you're in school or at work, but you're not. You're working for yourself, so you get to make the big bucks. It's so good. <laughs> All right, guys, we got to go. We love you. We're going to be here with you. We cannot wait to see what you do on your journey, and we will see you on the other side. Peace. Later.